this week's video is about engine problems. More specifically, the overheating of an engine due to a skin tank not being suitable for the size of the engine that is on board. I'll get Peter to tell you a bit more about the technicalities of what's been going on with it. Technical details are not my forte, you might have gathered, but they're certainly his. My name's Marianne and I am part-time boater. Well, I did say that I would ask Peter to tell you a bit more about the skin tank cooling problem that we were having. So here's Peter and um, he's a fount of knowledge compared to me. So over to you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, when I bought the boat, one of the things I was looking at was a big enough engine to go on uh, rivers and maybe even tidal waters. Uh, so I was looking for 35 or bigger uh, horsepower uh, engine. So this boat came with a 43 horsepower engine, but I soon found that I couldn't use the power properly, uh, not for extended periods of time, because the way that uh, boat engine, well, narrow boat engines are cooled is that the the coolant comes out of the engine and it actually flows to two different places on this boat one is the calorifier which uh, is our hot water tank so a, a pipe runs through the middle of the calorifier carrying water from the engine and heats up our domestic water uh, and a completely separate pipe goes to a a, um, a tank welded to the inside of the hull and water flows into the top and then th uh, through to the bottom and the heat in the water is supposed to transfer out into the canal water. The, the design and build of the skin tank is left to the boat builder but the engine manufacturers provide guidelines as to what the skin tank should look like and how the pipes are laid out and for a 43 horsepower engine a beta marine uh, who made our engine recommend a 10 10 and a half square feet uh, skin tank and it's they're supposed to be quite thin as well two or three inches thick and as far as I can measure measuring our tank I reckon it's more like seven Ooh. Maybe a little bit more. Really? Yes. I didn't know that. Yes, it's quite a big step down. Um, what I found was, if, if I was cruising, uh, on a normal day's cruising, you're constantly stopping or slowing down past other boats, or you're stopping at locks. Mm. And it's sort of okay with that. But if you get a long stretch where there's no one around and there are no locks, for example, going through Milton Keynes, for 17 and a half miles there's just one lock oh okay and the engine would get hot or I found also going upstream up the River Thames <clears throat> one early problem which uh, baffled me was I kept finding air inside the skin tank when I eventually found that there was an air bleed valve on the top and uh, I I looked on the Beta Marine website and they maintain a register of certified engineers. So I called one and uh, he couldn't come out to look at the boat because he was laid up with a broken leg. But mm -hmm. as he had nothing better to do, we talked for quite a while about engine uh, and cooling designs. And he said that this problem of having a too small skin tank is very common on narrow boats because the builders think it'll be fine and most of the time it is. Um, he also pointed out that I needed I wasn't bleeding the skin tank correctly and since I started doing that I, I found I was getting a lot of air out of there. So while we've been sitting here <laughs> trying to record, now this is our first time recording like this, bearing in mind we've had one boat going that way and this is the third boat in the space of about a minute going forward. 
So you were saying about the skin tank, um, since you started reading it correctly, you were getting... Yes, it got better then, mm. um, but it still wasn't right. Um, to put some figures on it, I mean, I can cruise at 1,000 or 1,100 RPM, and that's probably okay. But the engine is rated at um, 43 horsepower at 2,800 RPM. Right. Now, you don't use that all the time, uh, and I can use it if I need to, like, suddenly go into reverse because somebody comes under a, a bridge without any warning or something like that. Um, but to continuously cruise at, say, 1,200 RPM is a real challenge for the engine. Mm. Um, a couple of engineers, because I've spoken to a number of people over the over the last three and a half years about this, uh, a couple, including the beta marine trained guys, said when the boat is blacked, make sure you don't have excessive blacking where the skin tank is. The trouble is, some people think that's a really good idea and some people think it's absolute nonsense. So, in a casual conversation with somebody I just happened to be mooring next to, a chap called Ratty, I've got no idea what his real name is, even now. <laughs> um, he had a traditional engine, has a traditional engine in his boat. But what he's done is put a domestic radiator in the engine room ah, right. uh, so that the hot water from the engine flows through that and through the skin tank, it, which has two effects. It gives you more area, cooling area, for the heat to dissipate, mm -hmm. but it also you need to put more coolant into the system, so uh, that also helps. So after a bit of discussion, I asked him if he could do the same for our boat. And it's been a bit of a trial because, first of all, Ratty had a lot of difficulty getting parts delivered. He kept having to go and fetch them himself, including the radiator, mm. um, because of the shortage of delivery drivers, apparently. We got it all in and connected up, and it it was a challenge to get the get air out of the system. And well, I won't bore you with all the details, but we had instances when water leaked into the into the bilge, um, and then we had to do other work. And we kept thinking, I wonder if there's something wrong with the water pump. Um, which is actually the, it's the coolant, I really should call it coolant, not water, um, that get, that pumps around the engine. Mm -hmm. um, I did speak to Beta Marine support line, which was very good, and uh, they were very helpful, but one of the things they said was, well, the pump in the engine moves the hot coolant, the, the coolant through the engine. Um, the movement through the radiators does depend on convection currents. So oh. once it's running, it runs. And, and that was the problem in getting it filled up, that the radiator, which is above the engine, wasn't getting the coolant pushed up into it. Ah, oh, right, okay. Until the engine got going, and, and you know this because you bled it while the engine <laughs> was did. running. I did, I did. And that's, that's when we got all the air out of Just it. Just as well I know how to bleed a radiator. <laughs> well, it's exactly how you do it at home. You I know. You bleed the radiator when the central heating pump's running. I know. So it's the same, it's the same principle. Yep. It's the opposite principle, bleeding a skin tank. That's what was confusing me. Oh, With that, okay. you have to bleed it when the engine's cold. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but we've been doing some tests recently, and it's still not perfect, but I think we perhaps live with it. Um, the alternatives that I've come across that people have had fitted is, one is a heat exchanger in the engine room, which brings water in from the canal passes it through the heat exchanger to cool the, the, the coolant and then pumps it back into the canal. Um, and I talked to someone who had that on his boat mm -hmm. and it's something you have to maintain so after a while he got rid of it oh. and he had a second skin tank welded to the outside of the boat. You really can't put it on the inside once the boat is built. Nice. Uh, but he had it welded to the outside on the other side and connected up 
and he said that's an absolute total fix. Right. Uh, the engine stays nice and cool all the time. However, it does mean taking the boat out of the water and a lot of, well, a certain amount of engineering work um, getting the skin tank fitted. We may end up doing that, I have to say. Right. We were trying to avoid that because the boat's already been out of the water just within the last couple of months to have it blacked. Yes, yeah. But it, it's, it's a little frustrating that the limitation on using the boat when, when there's nothing else slowing you down is, um, is temperature. And there are certain things you can do on the canal system which I wouldn't want to do without an absolutely solid uh, cooling uh, system. For example, traveling from Liverpool docks to the top end of the um, Shropshire Union Canal along the Mersey estuary. Mm -hmm. uh, traveling from the end of the Kenneth Navin up to Sharpness on the Severn estuary in either direction. Yeah. Um, traveling across the wash, which I've only just recently found out is possible. Uh, and to some extent, you know, there are rivers where, which are part of the canal network, like the Thames. In the winter, the Thames has often has strong current and mm -hmm. it often has current too strong for narrow boats or small boats to travel anyway. So we get banned. Yes. But well, I have done a run from Teddington to Weybridge going upstream when it was in the medium condition, the amber um, flags. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did have to stop halfway for a bit of cool to let the engine cool off a bit. It's not that long a journey though. Mm. Um, but for all, all of those reasons, it would be nice to have total confidence in the cooling system. Possibly if we picked a slightly bigger radiator, which we might have been able, we could have done with hindsight. Mm. That might have made a difference. But um, yeah. this is where we are today. Um, Ratty has made a number of calls trying to fix it. And I know he's been doing research, talking to other people about, about this. And I've done research and that's why I know it's, it's, it's a well-known problem um, with boats. I don't know if it, it was a period where boat builders did this and now they don't. There are certainly a number of instances of this. And when I said to the Beta Marine support people, we're thinking of putting a, a domestic radiator in the loop, he just said, oh yes, that's a good idea. Um, and so they were aware of it. Mm. Um, if my measurements of the tank are correct, they say that I've got a tank which is more suitable for a Beta 28, 28 horsepower rather than 43. Right. So, um, I've still got the power of the engine when something dramatic happens and and I need to, like for example uh, on the Grand Union there's a point which caught me completely by surprise the first time where just yeah. as you're about to go under a bridge there's such a strong stream comes in from the left that canoeists have hung up slalom gates and they use it to practice their slalom skills. <laughs> And I, I went flying through there, um, heading straight towards a wide beam that was more just the other side of the bridge, which is not the best place for it. And the only way to avoid it was to open the throttle fully to get real power pushing on the rudder, you know, the, the, the prop spinning so that the, the rudder is getting lots of force on it so that it can turn the boat mm -hmm. uh, hard. And I, I missed this wide beam by a couple of coats of paint. <laughs> you know, I thought, you know, I, if I open the throttle, if I don't open the throttle, I'm going to hit it. If I do open the throttle, I might still hit it, but I'll hit it really hard. <laughs> but on the other hand, it seemed to be the only way of not hitting it. And it did just about work. Um, but the engine power is there for that. So it's not, you know, it's not that the engine's wasted. Yeah, I'll put a link to the slalom. Um, oh, you've got photographs, haven't you? I have done a video where we went through that bridge, and that was my first experience of going under that bridge, and the slalom was on the right. We were going the other way. Um, so I'll put a link at 
that's uh, in the comments below, or rather at the end of the video. Yes, yes. To get through that, you have to. It, it it's <laughs> it's quite hard to do until you get used to it. You basically point the boat at the big stone buttress on one <laughs> side of the bridge, and and just go for it. And you need to have the throttle fairly well open anyway. And you know, you just think maybe it's not flowing today because nothing's happening and then suddenly the boat goes sideways and you're through the arch. I have to say that when I was on the boat and I said to him, you're heading for the wall and he said, yes, I know. And he was as calm as you like. And I said, okay. I just had to believe that he knew what he was doing and he did. And in fact, once we hit the, the rush of water, it just straightened the boat and we were past it in a very, very sm smoothly actually. But yes, um, my eyebrows were raised at that point. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed behind the back, you know, because yes. it, it does. Every time you do it, you think it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel right. But it is the, you know, it the is right thing the to way do. to do it. You know. Yeah, head for a brick wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, since I have been on the boat, which is about a week ago, I expected to do quite a lot of cruising. But the first few days were taken up with Ratty uh, doing his, his alterations of the cooling system. So we did our first run to Cropredy and back to Banbury in a day um, on Saturday, I think yeah, it Saturday. was. Yes. Saturday. And the reason we went back to Banbury is because the engine was reaching almost 90. Well, it was over 90, wasn't it? Was it was over, yes. Going into 100. We didn't quite hit the red, and we thought we cannot carry on cruising. We've got no peace mm. of mind. So we went back to Banbury, moored in a different place, and then went to Halfords on the Sunday and got some coolant, and then Peter added the coolant in. And then we thought, right, let's do another run to Cropredy and see how it went. And this time it didn't go as high as 90. I think it reached 80, didn't it? It was... Yes, it got a bit warm, but um, it, I, I, I had I'd also reading up on coolant properties as well, and I realised then that you need to keep the coolant in because it it cools the engine. You know, it does a better job than plain water, and because of the problems and the fitting difficulties and taking things out, putting them in again, taking the water pump out, and and refurbishing it and then putting it back um, we ended up with a very weak solution in the cooling system because we kept adding water yeah and the run the first run to Cropody was with a very weak solution um, and also you bled the radiator fully on on the way that, there yeah on that trip. so that that allowed the radiator to do more work um, and I, I topped up concentrated uh, coolant um, and then I used a little sampler that I've got, which told me that we're still a kind of a medium level mixture. We could beef it up a bit more, and I, I, I will where, when I can. You need to take a little bit of the coolant out. I don't want to overfill it. Mm. Um, but that, those two things seem to have made the difference. Right, okay. So, uh, so it now works. So the last couple of days when I've dragged the deck boards up before we set out, and hung upside down over the whole checking things um, there's been nothing to find you know there's no no leakages in the bilge um, the skin tank doesn't need bleeding the radiator doesn't need bleeding and when I take the filler cap off the coolant's up to the correct level good so it's all looking pretty good then so hopefully we can we've got something we can live with it would be nice if it was a little bit more uh, if it, it did it had more cooling capacity but yeah. I think that we can probably work with what we've got until such time as we do something different. Well, for our trip now, it is going to be fine, I think. But for any future trips on any of the navigations that Peter mentioned earlier, I think changes will probably have to be made. But that's probably not going to be till next year at the earliest, I would have thought, to do any of those major runs. We have plans for cruising this year a little bit more than we have in the last 18 months that's for sure but that's the same as everybody mm. but now we know that the engine is going to be more stable and cooler it's it's hovering at about 80 degrees is it yeah 80 is normal yeah and uh, it can it can go a little bit above that 
um, it, on a long day. Yeah. Um, but it's it used to regularly head up towards the, the red. I mean, the worst was just before it was all done. I was travelling back up towards Banbury and I left the, the engine ticking over on the lock landing while I went to um, get ready. There was a boat coming down, so there was a bit of a delay. And when I got back, the engine temperature alarm had gone off. Oh. And normally when you leave the engine ticking over, it cools down. Mm. I did wonder whether keeping the coolant going around the system would keep it, would help it cool down. But it, yeah, it, it seems that switching off is the quickest way of cooling it. Well, this trip that we're on is our second trip through Cropredy. We actually stopped in Cropredy because we heard that Micron Theatre were coming mm. uh, the next day. And we love Micron Theatre. Um, their productions are stunning. If you haven't encountered them, then do a search for them. Find out where they're going. This is a shameless plug for them. And we're not getting paid or anything. But Stray there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but they are a fantastic theatre company. And I think you will enjoy their productions if you do manage to catch one. Uh, we've been following them for the last three years now, haven't we? Since yes, we've been on the boat. Yes. And... If we're in the vicinity or if we know we can make one of their shows, we make an effort to do so because they are fabulous. So that was our stopover in Cropredy and we left Cropredy yesterday morning. Um, and now we have cruised further up the Oxford Canal and we've just moored up for the night. And as you can see, the sun is still very bright. It's beautiful and warm, even though I'm sitting here in a jumper and scarf, but that's why I'm beautiful and warm, you see. Um, yeah, so... I hope you found everything that Peter had to say about the cooling system interesting and informative and maybe you have some have had some issues with cooling in which case please leave a comment um, about your problems and your solutions but we'll see how we go over this next uh, trip and um, I'll keep you posted as to temperatures and etc. Yes, because the, the only other suggestion we had was the, the other night in the pub in Cooperty, which was to put a fan behind the new radiator. Ah, oh, yes. Just like you do on a car. Now, there is a difference, <laughs> and I didn't point it out at the time, but a car radiator is a honeycomb, so you can blow air through it, uh, okay. whereas a domestic radiator is a solid slab. Yes. So I'm not very taken with that idea and i'd certainly not enough to rig up uh, a, an electric fan if you had a fan from underneath blowing up through the fins would that work yeah i guess that might that might do it something it yeah something like um almost something like the cooler fans you get on pc yeah um yeah, work basis yes Yes, so that's an option, but it's not one that we're going to be um, embarking on. We have other options first, but the first one is just to see how the engine handles on this trip and move on from that. And, of course, we could put liquid nitrogen in, but that's a bit expensive. <laughs> <laughs> that's the first I've heard of liquid nitrogen in, in the cooling system. Well, you know, it's natural. It's at, at uh, zero Kelvin, so it'll keep everything cold. <laughs> If it doesn't freeze, if, no, it won't freeze it if it's zero Kelvin, will it? <laughs> Probably shatter the block. <laughs> Probably. We don't want to go down that path. No, that was a joke. Just in case you were thinking he was serious. It was a joke. It was a joke, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, so um, at this point, I'd just like to say thank you to all my subscribers. I really appreciate you taking the time to subscribe to this channel and to, to watching the videos that I put out. If you haven't already subscribed and you found today's one interesting, please consider subscribing. And if you've enjoyed the video, then like and share it far and wide because I could do with a few more in my community. I'd like to call it a community. I have some wonderful people that comment week in, week out, and I really enjoy reading their comments and responding to them. So um, from us, from the middle of nowhere on the Oxford Canal, until next week and next week's video. Bye. Bye. <laughs>